Mike Schuster, I'm a postdoc here in the Department of Forest Resources. Uh, and I work on this project called Cover It Up. Uh, basically, we're looking at what happens after buckthorn has been removed, basically treating that, that sick patient that Paul was talking about, uh, and trying to figure out a way to keep buckthorn out once it's been removed initially. Uh, and I work on this with a bunch of people, um, some of which are actually listed on the slide. Uh, so Peter Rake, Peter Reich, and Lee Freelick are in the Department of Forest Resources with me. Uh, and these folks down here, including Alex, Paul, uh, Sean, and Ann Pierce, uh, are, are collaborators on the grant. But there's also a large number of collaborators uh, at our various experimental sites and uh, associated organizations that have made this possible. And uh, they'll get recognized at the, at the end, too. So all right. Um, Basically, there's this idea that we've kind of been dancing around that Buckthorn is an ecosystem engineer. This is basically fundamental to the issue of Buckthorn, that Buckthorn invasions alter the structure and function of ecosystems uh, profoundly as it becomes more abundant in that system. And uh, as a result of that, they are able to form very dense stands. These dense stands, of course, have negative consequences on native biodiversity. Uh, forage and habitat for animals and nutrient cycling. And it's also a very good example of invasion meltdown with earthworms where earthworms and buckthorn both help each other out uh, and emphasize or exacerbate the problem of each other going forward. Uh, and all these things together create a situation where uh, even after you remove buckthorn, the system is filled with resources and primed for buckthorn reinvasion. So the initial removal is just the beginning of the battle against buckthorn, right? It keeps coming back. And generally, buckthorn removal is viewed as a maintenance activity. You have to keep doing it over and over again with little long-term gain uh, in the end. And that's because of these guys here. Uh, both re-sprouts from the stem and germinants from the seed bank. Germinants from the seed bank uh, are able to exploit those conditions created by buckthorn removal to rapidly reinvade the system. So uh, we talked a little bit about we talked a little bit about um, ooh, all right, here we go. All right, we talked a little bit about how resprouts come back, the issues that they pose, they're able to you know, grow up to a meter in height within a few months of removal, thus effectively shading out native uh, reestablishment right from the get-go. But over the long run, uh, three to five years even, you can have reestablishment of buckthorn from seed. Uh, buckthorn is a prolific seed producer, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And so it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not uncommon to see uh, these chia pets of, <laughs> of buckthorn germinants uh, after the removal. Uh, so when we look at a site that's been uh, treated for buckthorn, uh, we generally see something like this in the months following, uh, you know, assuming incomplete herbicide application or before herbicide application. <laughs> this is all uh, re-sprouts uh, and a few germinants in there. And so this presents a whole suite of challenges on its own. But uh, buckthorn, just like any other plant, is not invincible. I know it's hard to believe. It's not invincible. Uh, it can be destroyed. And um, it has a limited set of conditions under which it can grow. Uh, buckthorn germinants in particular, so things coming from the seed bank, can be susceptible to being shaded out. Uh, some anecdotal and preliminary evidence suggests that perhaps around 98% shade uh, is where buckthorn starts to kind of peter out. I know, a very simple goal, 98% shade. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, it's, it's a goal. And <laughs> so there are these exceptionally dark conditions created by a, co a combination of canopy shading and understory shading that produce conditions where buckthorn can be excluded. Either it's going to germinate and just persist as a very small individual, um, or just you know, not exist at all. It's just, gonna, to, it's just gonna die and not really establish there. Uh, 
slightly lighter sites are areas that we can uh, kind of consider the suppression zone where it's dark, but the buckthorn is still able to grow. It's uh, growing at a slower rate than it would under optimal conditions. And while these systems might have a temporary reprieve from buckthorn invasion, eventually they're going to succumb to uh, buckthorn in the long run. And then really light sites are kind of in this proliferation area where buckthorns are just going to have a heyday and, and uh, ruin your life. So, so the question is how do we move from these highlight proliferation areas caused by buckthorn removal back into uh, the suppression or exclusion zones where buckthorn is going to have a harder time or, or just be kept out altogether. Uh, we have a couple options for this uh, where we can either you know, increase canopy shading over the very long run or more realistically from a management perspective, we can increase understory shading to push us uh, into this exclusion zone using the herbaceous layer or the understory uh, shrubs and stuff like that. <laughs> Notably, uh, these states may be different from the perceived historic state. So we have to consider different species assemblages than we might, have, we might think have existed there in the past or exist there now. Um, because obviously what's there right now isn't working. So we need to try a variety of different species assemblages to push us into this exclusion zone. Uh, and, and that's basically the, the goal of the Cover It Up project, is to figure out a way into that exclusion zone using plants. Uh, specifically, we started off asking, how do different light environments affect buckthorn? Basically trying to figure out where that exclusion zone is, where that suppression zone is, and where the proliferation zone is. Uh, and we started doing that using the IDENT experiment up in Cloquet. This is a forest biodiversity experiment where different combinations of of uh, angiosperm and gymnosperms are planted uh, at different uh, diversity levels. And that experiment looks at a whole suite of different ecosystem functions, but what we're using it for is its light gradient that it creates. Um, planting species in different combinations creates a different uh, gradient, creates a gradient of canopy shading. And so we planted in buckthorn germinants into all 192 of these ident plots um, a year and a half ago in uh, 2016. And we've been monitoring their progress since. So you can kind of see an uh, example of the different conditions created here. Uh, there's a little flag right here. That's where our germinant is. You can see it. There's plenty of visibility here. So that's a highlight condition. Uh, and then here you can't, you can't see it. So uh, that's a, a darker site. Uh, as you might expect, broadleaf plots in that experiment produced less shade about 85% shade on average, sticking it uh, solidly in the proliferation zone or, or something near there. Uh, and then a mix of broadleafs and conifers had about 95% shade, and conifers alone got us to be about 85 or 98% shade on average. So presenting a really nice uh, range of light conditions that you might see in forests in Minnesota. So as I mentioned, we monitored the growth of these germinants uh, over the past two growing seasons. And uh, we can see that over that time period, our seedlings have already become sensitive to differences in light availability. So this is percent shading on the x-axis for both of these graphs. And then either height of the germinant or the number of leaves <laughs> present on it on the y-axis. And both of these are highly correlated with buckthorn mass. So you can basically look at these as as two graphs showing mass of buckthorn. And you can see in both cases, uh, initially buckthorn is, is relatively insensitive to shading. There's a long stretch of the gradient here where uh, height doesn't decrease, number of leaves doesn't decrease, but suddenly when we hit about 95% shading, in either case, we see uh, buckthorn mass start to plummet. And uh, that's encouraging. That means that, yes, there is some threshold here where buckthorn performance is reduced at least. Right. And because this is so tightly correlated with light availability, the uh, suppressive effect of different uh, functional types of trees is, is different. So 
brown leaves produce the largest buckthorns, whereas mixes and conifers produce smaller buckthorns. So conifers result in smaller buckthorns overall compared to brown leaves. Right. So that's the first step, is trying to get an idea of where that uh, exclusion and suppression zones are. The next step then is seeing if we can actually apply these principles via revegetation to uh, buckthorn removal. See if there's a way we can put different species into those systems to keep buckthorn out over the longer term. So specifically we asked how do dense seeding and planting of native species affect buckthorn reestablishment. And I should note, um, I don't want to lean too heavily on this, but uh, basically revegetation as a rest restoration technique as a uh, way to keep invasive species out is most commonly done in grasslands with less application in forested systems. So um, that lends a little bit of novelty to our experiment here looking at how to use plants to suppress buckthorn. Um, so the first step here, or the first, the first of two experiments that we have running on this subject uh, is a large plot seeding experiment. This is uh, a basic setup here where we take a 12 or 24 meter wide uh, strip of land that's 60 meters long and split it up into four different parts. And then those four different parts are exposed to a factorial combination of herbicide, which is a crinite, uh, a bud inhibitor, or uh, seeding with herbaceous species. So we have things where there's a complete control, plots where we seed without herbicide, plots where we herbicide without seed, and then plots where we have both seed and herbicide. Again, bringing in this multi-tool approach to restoration. Uh, and within each of those plots, we lay down a transect that's either 25 or 50 centimeters wide. And along that transect, we are monitoring the abundance of buckthorn, counting all the little buckthorns in this, uh, in this transect. This is Carl, one of our interns. He he uh, start, started uh, saying germinant uh, in his, his sleep because he was counting so many buckthorns. So, um, yeah. Uh, so we count the abundance of buckthorn. We monitor the germination and growth of buckthorn phytometers that we plant alongside these transects. So uh, we have seed and, and seedlings that we put specifically along this transect so we have a controlled measure of buckthorn performance. And then we also measure the understory composition environment, looking at which plants are there and how much light they allow through, soil moisture, things like that. Uh, and this is replicated 29 times across seven sites. So there's 29 of, of these big blocks uh, around the metro area. The seeding treatment, which uh, I'm sure you're curious about, uh, includes 35 different species, but these are some of the, the more significant ones. We have a few varieties of wild rye, bottle brush grass, grass, hairy wood, limbrome, uh, and then for Forbes we have things like brown-eyed Susan, long-leaf aster, white snake root, and tall meadow root, and sedges including plains oval sedge and eastern star sedge. These are species that we selected A because they're either included in existing restoration mixes or because we hypothesized that they're able to produce heavy shade that might get us into the exclusion zone. Uh, and overall this mix was seeded at 122 seeds per square foot. Uh, again, looking for that high propagule pressure to really make sure we get an established herbaceous layer. Uh, and we seeded it in February of 2017, so just a few months ago. This is paired with a uh, second experiment, a second concurrent experiment, which we uh, have these 1.2 by 1.2 meter small plots where we plant uh, different species into directly, so not by seed, but as, as living individuals. Uh, and we compare the performance of buckthorn within these plots to uh, our seed mix and to unseeded areas within a deer exclosure. So this is within a fenced environment, which is a, an important, important caveat there. Uh, and so this is what one of those plots looks like. Again, here's Carl. Um, and uh, within those small plots, we're measuring germination and growth of buckthorn. Uh, the understory composition and environment, and also phenology, because we expect that the timing of, of leaf events for these species in these small plots are going to have some significant impact on, on buckthorn, which, uh, again, basically just stays green forever. So, 
Uh, and this is replicated 18 times across three sites. And then we also have two partner sites that are running modified versions of this experiment. Those small plot species uh, are planted in one of four ways. One is with plugs of Pennsylvania sedge, looking somewhat like this. Uh, another is with ostrich ferns, which I don't have a picture of. Another is a shrub cocktail, including uh, American hazel, common and red-berried elder, and gray dogwood. And then the fourth is a tree mixture of balsam fir and sugar maple. Uh, and uh, as we might expect, uh, the, the different treatments were able to produce different, uh, of different amounts of shading and consequently had a bigger impact on, on mean buckthorn mass. So we have unplanted controls right here. Uh, and you can see that sedges, trees, and shrubs all produce smaller buckthorns compared to that unplanted control. Right. And that's because they increase shade. So you see that mirror image of, of that trend where unplanted controls have relatively little shade. This is just like the ambient canopy shading that we have here, um, plus natural revegetation. And then sedges, trees, and shrubs produce uh, higher levels of shade concurrent with their higher cover. So if we go back to that conceptual diagram that I showed you earlier with canopy shading on top and understory shading on the x-axis, uh, we can see that we started somewhere here uh, with the unplanted plots. The sedges are a little bit darker, the ferns and trees are a bit darker still, and then the shrubs pr provide, on average, the greatest shading essentially moving us from this initial condition in restoration to, uh, to uh, somewhere closer to the exclusion zone. And this is just based on uh, a one year's growth after planting. When we compile data from all those small plots as well as the big seeding plots, we see that consistent, uh, a consistent effect of shading on buckthorn performance. Again, this is shading on the x-axis and mean seedling size on the y-axis. And just like we saw with the IDENT experiment, we see right about 95% we start to see buckthorn performance uh, take a nosedive. Um, when we plot all those uh, plots on top of this conceptual diagram with the small plot planting plots in blue and the large plot seeding plots in black, uh, we can really start to see that the exclusion zone is occurring somewhere between 95 and 99 percent. Each of these dots is scaled to the relative size of buckthorn in those plots. So you see lots of big dots down here and lots of tiny dots over here, uh, suggesting that, that we're actually able to suppress buckthorn in these, these small dot plots. Notably, uh, there are some herbaceous volunteers that, that are able to uh, put our plots into this exclusion zone or into this really dark area. Uh, and an important caveat is that this is just our first year of seeding. This is our first full field season. And while we seeded last uh, February, a lot of that seed hasn't taken yet. And so almost all of the shading effect caused in our in our uh, large plot seeding trials is due to uh, natural volunteer species. So things that are just coming back out of the seed bank. Um, and so in these plots in particular, uh, the good news is that they're, they're shading quite heavily, but the bad news is that they're also just filled with invasives. So, <laughs> um, and so a lot of these plots are, are dominated by like creeping Charlie, garlic mustard, and uh, indeed, buckthorn is, is coming back in, in one of those plots pretty heavily. Uh, but overall, this provides a challenge because, of course, we don't want to just remove buckthorn to get a big patch of garlic mustard. That, that's not great. Uh, but it also provides us with the opportunity suggesting that maybe we need to consider species that are able to occupy this, this niche exclusively uh, going forward. But either way, species selection and continued management are key to the success of, of uh, revegetation strategy overall. 
So in summary, uh, woodland revegetation is relatively uncommon, but based on theory and its application in grassland systems, we can expect that it has some promise, some, some likelihood of, of working. Uh, currently, we're able to show that uh, high shade does reduce the performance of buckthorn, especially in those uh, plots that have been planted with shrubs that are producing more than 95% shade on average. And in the future, we're going to continue to monitor these plots uh, because, again, it's just been the first, the first growing season. So we expect that over time, the treatment effects are going to become more divergent, stronger, uh, and potentially give us a better idea of how we can use revegetation to control buckthorn in the long run. So that's, uh, that's it. I want to say thank you. Uh, here, uh, especially I want to thank the field and lab uh, technicians that we have. These are the guys that actually did, did all the work. It wasn't just Carl. Uh, <laughs> uh, he is one of them. But uh, we had a, lot, a big team of people that, that helped do the work, uh, as well as um, all of our collaborators for uh, research sites and providing materials for that. Uh, our sedges and ferns were provided by a three parks district and then our funding of course is through, through the MIT PPC and the LCCMR. So, thanks. Thank, thank you, Mike. I think we have time for one or two questions. I'm not sure I understood um, this right, but it sounded like you did had a control plot with no herbicide and no plantings done in it. Yep. But then in your results, um, you were showing that, and that control was the one that had the least uh, buckthorn um, suppression. Uh, yeah, so, so, do, do, do. sorry. So this is, yeah, so in the small plot experiment we have uh, unplanted, we have unplanted small plots where they're inside the fence. Mm -hmm. There's no herbicide there at all. Um, there's no herbicide in, in any of these small plot experiments because we don't want to nuke our, our shrubs or our trees or anything like that. But um, yeah, in this situation, the, the completely unmanipulated control has the lowest level of suppression. So then my follow-up my follow question to that is, um, in your other results, you were showing that um, the need of the volunteers were coming mm -hmm. back yeah. and having some decent suppression. Mm -hmm. So that seems contradictory. Yeah, so, so this, this plot right here, um, basically the, these are all the plots individually, whereas that is a um, aggregation, the average of, of those plots. Um, and so here the uh, the black dots are, are in the large plot seeding experiment, and it, it doesn't differentiate between plots that were seeded or not seeded or treated with herbicide or whatever. Um, this is just all those plots presented as they are, and so it's not really an issue of whether or not the seeding was effective or mm -hmm. the herbicide was effective here. It's just as the plots exist currently, regardless of how that came to be, the ones that have more shading have less buckthorn. So the, the interpretation is not that that, um, that native volunteers or unplanted plots are going to be uh, sufficient or insufficient. It's just that darker plots have smaller buckthorn. Okay, and then if I can ask a follow-up question. Um, have you looked at um, how the doing plantings might actually be affecting whatever native um, species might be coming up that you might want, you know, from um, the seed bank? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So uh, we haven't done that, that experiment yet. Um, that's one of the things we're going to be monitoring or that we are monitoring going forward is the species composition in um, all of these plots comparing it to unplanted controls. And uh, so far we don't have a, an answer to that. We, we're not able to address that, but we should know in the long run. One of the issues, uh, of course, is that in a lot of these heavily invaded sites, the native seed bank is relatively depleted. And so it's hard to say you know, if, if we're actually you know, doing any harm there or not, because it, there might not be any, anything there to begin with. So. 
Um, I was wondering, and you may not be able to answer this, maybe a stupid question, but in grasslands, it seems like there's more competition from roots. And in forests, it seems like it's a shade issue. Do you think that's the case? Any guess? Yeah. Um, so yes and yes and no. Certainly when there's more light, when light is less limiting, other factors are going to be more important. Uh, competition for nutrients and water and grasslands, we would expect to be a more important factor. But there's also work showing that, that light, light availability in grasslands can be limiting as well. So, um, so kind of. <laughs> One more question here. Um, are you planning at all uh, down the road to look at uh, earthworm interaction? Um, yeah, so that's a that's a, another great question. Um, hi. Uh, so we we did a rapid assessment of earthworm invasion at all of our sites prior to establishing the experiment, and they were all really bad. Uh, so <laughs> so we. So we could do an assessment of, of earthworm impacts on this experiment, but there's basically not enough variability for us to be able to parse that out. So okay. they're, they're, all, they're all earthworm city, if, yeah. if that helps. Um, it, it hurts us, but it, it helps our understanding. So. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, let's give Mike another hand here.